Okay, well, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So it's it's a great 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 pleasure to introduce Sander van Kosteren. Um, he's a professor at Leiden uh, Institute of Chemistry. Uh, Sander got his PhD in Oxford uh, on building synthetic uh, glycoproteins using chemistry, uh, and then did uh, subsequent postdocs in immunology and proteostasis. So that allowed some pretty fantastic training to do some work with bioorthogonal chemistry, microscopy, uh, real-time cell uh, phenotypic control using light and, and all sorts of very, very cool stuff. Um, you know, our regular attendees at a, a low frequency uh, sound research conference in, in Tilburg, um, but we're, we're not quite ready to talk about that stuff yet. But without further ado, uh, Sandra, if you want to share your screen, we'll, uh, we'll get to hear about your love-hate story with lectins. Yes, um, definitely a, a love-hate story, and I'm going to go actually quite far back in time uh, to explain uh, the origin of, um, well, the research now and of the love-hate, because I love carbohydrates. You can't get away from them, uh, even when you try as hard as you can. Um, yeah, so this is the, the title I've given this talk, Carbohydrate Lectin Interactions, a love-hate story. There will be three or four Star Wars references um, they depress me nowadays when I tell my student or when I put them in talks for students because many students don't get them anymore because they're too young. Um, so I'll start with the hate. And that was actually my PhD and the first three years of it. And I've uh, uh, summarized the successes in this slide. I spend um, the bulk of my PhD trying to chemically synthesize Sala Lewis X. It was a a whimsical idea of Ben, ben Davis to say, oh, why don't you uh, do a Sala Lewis X synthesis? It's published. It should take a few months. Uh, it didn't uh, until I started using some of the enzymes, uh, some of which were actually developed, I think, by people in the audience uh, today. So um, then finally, near the end of my PhD, we managed and we managed to create some synthetic glycoproteins. And as soon as we could start doing biology with the carbohydrates, uh, I fell in love with them because um, we started making contrast agents, synthetic proteins, uh, multimeric uh, iron oxide agents. We could use the Sala Lewis X to show inflammation in rat brain uh, in various guises. And I got some nice papers out of it that really uh, helped kickstart my career. But after four years of that, I was quite ready for a change. Um, so I thought I'd step away from carbohydrates for uh, a little bit. Uh, which had turned out to be quite a long little while that I that I stepped away from them. Uh, and I moved into immunology uh, to the uh, laboratory of Colin Watts uh, in Dundee, who is interested exclusively in the dendritic cell that I will from now on call the DC. It's basically been in the news a lot without being mentioned because it's the cell that takes up uh, vaccines or antigen processes and degrades it and then presents part of these vaccines to T cells that they then activate. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm, just, I'm, I'm talking to my own face, which is very strange. Um, and these T cells, as you all now know, are very much needed to kill a virus infected cell, but can also be used to kill a cancer cell. Uh, other T cells orchestrate other immune responses. And most importantly, a good vaccine will give you good long-term immunological memory that uh, will prevent you from getting sick in uh, future encounters with a pathogen. So my research actually focuses on three aspects of this process in biology. Uh, the T cell activation, where I basically I'm developing tools uh, to kinetically control in space and in time uh, the, the activation of these cells and to check how much peptide actually is needed to activate a cell uh, and other related issues. Um, the original uh, love, uh, possibly uh, due to my my rather uh, my younger days where I liked a lot of really noisy punk rock music, uh, was in the degradation and the destruction of the antigens that these cells do um, after the initial uptake. And what I find quite beautiful about this, even though I'm not going to talk about it, is that they take a very chaotic process where over 20 proteases all quite promiscuous, the great proteins, and yet they seem to get a sense of uh, fidelity 
by this process, even though these levels of proteases and their activities can change from cell to cell, from type to type, uh, yet this can be used to um, activate immune cells um, in different occasions, different systems. Uh, here already you may start seeing some glycans. We're actually looking at the role of glycans in the processing of peptide antigens, uh, looking at uh, autoimmune antigens and how post-translational modifications other than glycosylation uh, can affect and alter this and actually lead to uh, diseases such as multiple sclerosis. And uh, we uh, are developing a click chemistry toolkit to study these processes in detail. Uh, the story I'm going to talk about today, which is why I won't go further into detail, is actually about the recognition event uh, between the antigen uh, and the dendritic cell, but more on that uh, later in the talk. So the, the, the one sort of story I would like to share with you from the, I'm going to call it the interbellum between uh, me working on carbohydrates and me working on carbohydrates is actually a story of imaging. Um, and what I noticed was that many microscopy techniques lack a lot of context for what's happening. Um, and um, context is quite important. Here you see a man called Alex Honnold. Um, and if this was fluorescence microscopy, you wouldn't think much of it if basically uh, you were looking for Alex Honnold and for nothing else. You wouldn't know his orientation, for example, uh, which already seems a little bit more impressive that he's hanging from one hand. But if you could see the whole picture, you would suddenly realize that this man is a complete lunatic. This is him about two thirds of the way up a, a wall called El Capitan, uh, that some of you may know in Yosemite Valley. Uh, and he climbed it uh, without a rope in a few hours, I believe. There's a movie made of it. It's actually very good. I recommend anyone who's into climbing to go and see it, unless you have vertigo, because it's a lot of drone shots like these, they're, they're very harrowing. But as I said, Microscopy was the original uh, problem. And other people like Ram Koster that I'm collaborating with, Paul Vukade, uh, uh, Ellisman, and many others realized the same thing. And they thought, okay, we need to develop technology that we can start seeing where in the cell a fluorescent signal is emerging from. And in this case, um, they decided to use, uh, to they develop the technique called correlative light electron microscopy. And um, so instead of seeing just fluorescence uh, by overlaying two images, you can actually see where in the cell a particular fluorescence signal is occurring from. And I really liked this technique when I started my own group and I thought it would be really good um, as a method to start looking on how antigen uh, moves through a cell, how, um, um, how enzyme activities are moving or are present in cells. Like for example, here, uh, so obviously here's the overview. So in these first pictures, this cell that I've just shown you, what we did was take a probe, a fluorescent probe for a particular cathepsin and show in green and show that all this cathepsin activity can be localized to endosomes only some of which are positive for the normal endo and lysosomal markers. Um, and my contribution to this field has been the combination of this correlative technique with click chemistry and with super resolution microscopy. Um, but before I go there, I uh, want to tell you about a, a story that was published a few months ago by Thomas Backham from my group, where we actually um, started using this technique to look at intracellular pathogen and learn something about the life cycle, because that's sort of the, uh, this sort of summarizes how I use uh, the whole technique. And these intracellular pathogens, uh, I know we're all focused on viruses now, which are also intracellular pathogens, but intracellular bacteria are still some of the most devastating pathogens that uh, plague humanity. So from uh, biblical diseases such as uh, leprosy, um, chlamydia uh, also, uh, is one, but also the most deadly one is mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, for which about one in four people uh, are apparently latent sufferers, and there are millions of new cases uh, uh, and many deaths uh, every year from this disease. And basically what this pathogen does after being inhaled, it lets itself be phagocytosed, 
uh, by uh, lung macrophages and dendritic cells and establishes a, a subcellular niche for itself in which basically it's using the host cell to hide from the rest of the immune system or from the parts of the immune system that can kill it, such as complement and uh, antibody-based uh, or, or an antibodies. In this niche, it basically manipulates the host cell to have a safe environment. It can actually divide and grow quite happily or stay latent and do many other things, but survive very successfully for very long time. Uh, the problem with this uh, from a treatment perspective is that in order to get to tuberculosis inside the cell, you need to cross two extra membranes plus the formidable membrane of micro the micromembrane of mycobacterium tuberculosis itself, uh, which is incredibly lipophilic uh, and then a peptidoglycan layer underneath it all. There's quite a bit of controversy about what this bacterium does inside the cell. Um, in, and how treatment with antibiotics actually affects its survival. And that's uh, the study of that is the topic of this paper, but I just want to show off the technique because it's got some nice pictures. So what we found we could do is take MTB, so no, uh, no safer alternative. Uh, this is proper uh, uh, infectious full active MTB. Um, that you can transfect actually with fluorescent proteins. Um, but what we found is that we could also incorporate two orthogonal click handles. Uh, one, this one here is a methionine analog that can be used to label um, all methionines of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the second click handle uh, is uh, alkyne D-alanine and it's incorporated very efficiently into the peptidoglycan of the bacillus. And what these handles gave us were basically three quantifiable parameters that would give us a sense of the viability of tuberculosis inside the macrophage. So uh, the, the fluorescent protein would be, uh, give us a sense of how much of the protein inside an MTB was intact by the end of our time course. Um, if all the proteins were degraded, but the amino acids were still there, we could see that in the form of uh, this handle here. Uh, and the cell wall and the ghosts of the cell wall, we could see by the labeling of the peptidoglycan, because quite often an MTB might be dead, but its, its membrane is so thick that it cannot be degraded, so you'll see empty membranes. Um, and what we did was uh, develop a technique that we could quantify this by EM. But just to show you what the uh, bacteria look like, once you uh, take a fluorescence, the bacterial pellet, take a fluorescence image after two click reactions, and then image the three colors, you can overlay them back onto the bacteria to show your triple labeled bacteria. So the experiments were basically time course. This is where we, we have macrophages infected or macrophage cell line infected uh, by MTB. Uh, and then we would wait in either in presence or absence of various drugs um, uh, at the end of the time, we would fix the sample, pellet it, then slice to 75 nanometers, load on a grid, do fluorescence microscopy after click reactions, and then do um, electron microscopy and correlate the two. So here you see one of these grids just under a normal light microscope. And if you zoom in, it's not very informative. So this is our, our thin layer of cells. But then if you look under the fluorescence microscope, you can here see uh, blue for the nuclei of the macrophages and then the various labels for MTB in uh, the other colors. The EM, uh, then once you're done with your fluorescent, you uh, uh, treat your samples with uh, urinal acetate uh, and, and or lead, and then do an, take an EM image, a TEM image, and then you actually see the whole cells. And then through, uh, by correlating the DAPI signal for DNA staining to the shape of the nuclei from the EM image, you can overlay the two images and, and really zoom in into very, very high detail. Uh, just to go back to this one, um, I calculated that if you were to print this picture at uh, 200 DPI, it would be 11 meters by 11 meters. So if you're feet and inches, about 34 
33, 34 feet by 33 feet. So these are very, very detailed two nanometer PM images on which you can overlay your fluorescence. So here you actually see the bacteria hiding uh, inside uh, the macrophages. And you already, uh, you can see that you have these clusters of bacteria that are clumped together in slightly spacious vacuoles. You have tight vacuoles. We also found bacteria and others have as well that have, were not in a vacuole, but in the cytosol. And um, for each of these populations, we could quantify uh, the amount of fluorescence per cell. So here we have the most photogenic one of all of them that had three labels, it was uh, nicely nearly spherical. You can very nicely see all the colors. And through a semi-automated masking strategy where we use this thick micromembrane uh, uh, to mask the areas of the bacteria from uh, the other areas of the cell, we could quantify the fluorescent signals per bacteria um, and learn how antibiotics affected these. The next step that we're actually uh, that we actually went to was actually we did this first, but for the sake of the story, I'll pretend it's the next step was to actually try to improve the resolution of the fluorescent image. So here's the traditional fluorescence and uh, by optimizing the, uh, the click chemistry um, and then using storm micros uh, microscopy, we could actually get the fluorescent signal to 20 nanometers uh, resolution rather than uh, 300 nanometers resolution. And this allowed us to um, basically look in more uh, spacious detail at uh, the proteins. We haven't actually managed to do any uh, biology with this yet because uh, we lost the microscope. Um, uh, we, we didn't lose it, we lost access to the microscope because my collaborator was moving just at the time that this paper was published, but that's now uh, back up and running again. But anyway, so after that little side note, I will actually go back to carbohydrates because as I said before, they are everywhere and particularly in the immune system and particularly on the cell surface of uh, immune cells for detecting uh, self and bacterial antigens. So in my aspect of work where I'm looking at the interaction between vaccine modalities and antibodies, um, or sorry, and, and dendritic cells, I'm actually, you can't escape um, lectins and carbohydrates. It's a, it's a fact of life, but luckily I don't have to synthesize them myself at the moment. And the first receptor that popped up uh, when I started working uh, in immunology was the Mannox receptor. It's quite a complex beast. Um, it's got a collagen binding domain, a cysteine rich domain that binds uh, sulfated uh, glycans, such as uh, sulfogalnac is the simplest motif. Uh, then it's actually got eight C type lectin domains. And at first, actually, I find it very hard to get from literature which of these is an actual active uh, C-type lectin domain, because some uh, papers say that only one of them is active, but uh, it's becoming a bit more apparent that uh, the other ones also uh, seem to be binding. This is all further complicated by the fact that the receptor itself is heavily glycosylated, uh, including uh, ligands for uh, its own binding domains. The c type lectin binds, uh, as the name would suggest, mannoses and other neutral su uh, sugars. And the final complicating factor, or not actually the final, the final complicating factor about the monomer is that it doesn't really have a defined signaling domain. So it does a lot of things in immune cells, but we don't really know how uh, and what the adapters are yet. Um, and some other, uh, 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 papers came out that, uh, amongst others, uh, by Dweck, Trickhammer, uh, and Amaris, that showed that you have different conformations of this receptor. So it can sit in a closed, semi closed conformation. You can have multimers, monomers, um, or, or in vitro. And we don't actually know what the biological meaning of this is. And then I move to my. Uh, uh, to an immunology lab to work on immunology and lo and behold there it was again 
uh, when uh, the group of uh, Kurtz with Sven Bergdorf showed that if you look here, here's fact plots of T cell activations. If you take a glycoprotein of albumin, it's a, the most commonly used model uh, antigen, and look at its capacity to activate a cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cell. Um, it does, a, does so quite nicely. Uh, but then if you add manan, you block the ability to activate the cytotoxic T cell. Your dendritic cell, you block it with manan, so you block apparently the mannose receptor, you lose this ability to activate a T cell. If you knock out the mannose receptor, you also lose that ability. Seemed pretty clear cut. I had a plan ready to write a grant and make synthetic glycoproteins where we could more precisely control glycosylation rather than the 300 different glycoforms in oval women that, that these people added. But then another paper came out by the Villadangles lab. It basically showed here, it's these top two lines that the mannose receptor was completely unnecessary for effective uh, antigen present or uh, cytotoxic T cell activation. Uh, so they showed the absolute inverse of the other story, making it even more relevant to start working with defined reagents and uh, start looking at these receptors. So um, we came up with a working hypothesis um, that this mannose receptor with all these different forms of complex biology may be rooting, um, maybe after ligation, have the ability to root antigens, so vaccine antigens, to a processing compartment that eventually leads to a very potent activation, downstream activation of a killer T cell, or that it does the opposite on the other cases, uh, that it can actually lead it to a compartment where all the antigens uh, as presented to a cytotoxic T cell are degraded. And that may be the different conformations, specific glycoforms were actually important in the study of this. Um, this is an incredibly difficult uh, problem to tackle. <clears throat> um, but then I decided to first start at the interaction point to start looking about whether we could quantify the interaction between a ligand and the lectin, the immune lectin on the surface of a living cell, and maybe get some kinetic information about this and see if we could see whether this resulted, uh, whether different glycans would lead to different uptake. And this is exactly uh, the point in time uh, where I uh, was at a conference uh, and met a friend, uh, or now a friend, then a, a compatriot, although Italian by origin, Lorenzo Albertazzi, whose interest is super resolution microscopy. Um, it's also the same meeting from which the other STORM project um, was started. So what he is very good at, uh, he was actually a materials chemist and using uh, this stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy uh, to image um, chemical materials with a very high resolution. And what you basically do, you have a fluorescently labeled object and using buffers and correctly chosen fluorophores, you uh, bleach the fluorophores transiently and let occasionally a single fluorophore uh, emit uh, after another. That fluorophore, you can then, uh, you find the middle of your conventional uh, ABBA limited uh, fluorescence, and you postulate the middle of where your molecule was, then the next one goes on and on, and suddenly, Rather than having a giant blob, you can have uh, a more clear cut image. So, what does this look like? Um, if we, this is actually some raw data uh, from the previous project. Uh, uh, so, here you see individual fluorophores blinking, and uh, basically, you stack the frames of the movie to get your overall image. And then your conventional fluorescence. Uh, uh, taken at the same magnification, your resolution looks like this, and then with super resolution, um, it's actually significantly improved with 20 nanometers being the best uh, achievable at the moment. However, 
it's not very useful and totally irrelevant to carbohydrate uh, imaging um, because you need very high laser powers leading to cell death uh, and you need very selective buffers, and selective fluorophores, you're limited in your colors uh, and you're limited to fixed experiments. Uh, but what Lorenzo was interested in was another technique called DNA paint uh, in which you don't make the fluorophores blink by, um, um, how do I say this? By uh, switching them off with a light pulse and a buffer, but rather by labeling the molecule of interest with a DNA strand and then flowing a fluorophore labeled DNA strand over the surface of, uh, uh, of your labeled sample. This DNA is slightly mismatched, so it will stay on for a few microseconds, then dissociate again, and then you can basically label individual molecules, which I think you can see here. So here you have your DNA and your dye strand. So your dye strand is labeled on the surface. And only when you have com uh, strand complementation uh, is your fluorophore in the field uh, of excitation and therefore emission. And you can, again, get this point spread function to get uh, high resolution images. The advantage, the major advantage is, is that you don't need high laser power uh, to do this. Um, but the DNA is a little bit complicated because what people tend to do for the very few examples of biological uh, life cell experiments is take a tight binding antibody labeled with a DNA strand to then start looking for their protein of interest. So Lorenzo actually came to me and asked me, do you know of any interaction in biology that's really weak? And I was like, well, carbohydrate lectin interactions are pretty terrible. He was like, perfect, let's try and do paint with those. And that's exactly what we did. And we didn't actually expect beforehand on how phenomenal, uh, instructive this technique could be. So what we did, rather than having poorly binding DNA strands complementing each other, we thought, what if we take relatively poorly binding uh, ligands for the receptor and uh, apply the same technology. So these, the unbound ligands are invisible because uh, they're diffusing and they're outside uh, the, the plane of excitation and only when bound to the receptor, in this case, the receptor on a, uh, a transfected cell line uh, does become fluorescent and it's only fluorescent for the duration that it's on, uh, associated with the receptor. And suddenly, this gave us a tool uh, that we could use to measure the relative on rate. Uh, we could monitor receptor diffusion over the cell surface. Um, and we could de determine the dwell time. Uh, so the amount of time that a specific ligand was bound to, the, uh, to an individual receptor, thereby giving us relative on rates diffusion and relative off rates. So we got relative binding kinetics for different carbohydrates. Um, so I work together with uh, Jeroen Codet and formerly Gijs van der Marel as well, uh, who is now retired. And with some of the uh, synthetic chemists, um, uh, with Tim Hogevorst and Wart Doelman from my group, we made a library of carbohydrate clustered labeled with a fluorophore. So we thought, first of all, we thought we'd very the mannose structure. So we made trimanocytes, dimanocytes, and monomanocyte based clusters, uh, but also sulfated uh, Galnac uh, based clusters. And we thought to, to check whether multivalency or distance between receptors had an effect that we make uh, uh, dimers of these uh, or dual clusters, clusters with a spacer of two carbohydrates with a spacer or clusters with uh, six sugars. We also changed the fluorophore, but that's uh, not relevant for this story. Uh, and we did the same with uh, the bigger clusters and uh, with the sulfate of Galnac. And then uh, started measuring. And here you see uh, the first movie um, uh, of the hexavalent uh, monomanocyte. Um, and each of these blinks is a binding an unbinding event. As you see, some, uh, some fluorophores stay on the surface longer before dissociation, 
uh, others go a bit quicker and others stay for a, for a very long time. And when you then basically stack the frames on top of each other again, uh, you can, for a given concentration of uh, uh, carbohydrate or of cluster in solution, you can determine how much of it has bound uh, to the cell surface in that uh, period of time. So the clusters that we made, uh, we made really um, quite simply, actually the, the chemistry that I used in my PhD, we simply introduced an alkyne because we weren't actually interested too much in the biology of the clusters. That's definitely a next step. Um, uh, we uh, click, used azetolysine uh, and alkyne sugars and clicked the clusters together and then introduced uh, the fluorophore uh, on an additional lysine at the end of the experiment. This gave us a really nice versatile uh, platform for um, basically making a wide array of carbohydrate uh, structures to quantify. Um, then we could use this by basically by counting the number of fluorescent pixels that appear within a given frame of time. Uh, so the event density per square micrometer to determine how well a carbohydrate bound. And what you see here is that for the monomanocyte, a uh, single monomanocyte gave very few events. Uh, uh, two mo uh, monomanocytes gave still very few events and that went up uh, as you got to a cluster of six, suggesting as is known, a multivalency in the binding. This multivalency shifted uh, to a lower copy number of the trimanocyte over time, which you see here. So you got higher binding at a lower number of carbohydrates. Uh, and the dimanocyte sits somewhere in the middle. The sulfated uh, uh, sugar only, the hexa uh, uh, sulfogalmac cluster bound to the other domain. With, uh, or that's the only one that we actually quantified in this experiment. We also looked at the trajectories on um, of the ligand bound receptors on the cell surface. And uh, basically, uh, we, if we take, if we work on the assumption that a dimerized receptor moves more slowly than a monomeric receptor, then uh, we can conclude um, that the binding is by, by and large monomeric. Um, I don't want to say this any stronger because we don't know if a monomeric receptor actually moves the same speed as a dimeric receptor in this case. But all the different clusters had very, very similar uh, diffusion coefficient in which the receptor moved over the uh, cell surface. Uh, the off rates we could also determine, and uh, we could show that certain carbohydrates had a, a longer dwell time, especially the, uh, the high, uh, trimanos clusters. Um, and from this, we could get relative kinetic information that we then, in the next step, um, could correlate to the internalization of uh, the receptor. So if we basically, rather than looking at uh, um, the cell surface of uh, where the manos receptor is, if we took a fluorescence image, uh, if we took a plane of fluorescence imaging in the middle of a cell, we could quantify the amount of fluorophore that was actually inside the cell. So he, here you see the taken up mannose receptor or the taken up ligand uh, moving through the cell rather than on the cell surface. We did this for many cells and here, what we found actually, I'll, I'll in view of time, skip to the conclusion that receptor dwell time and occupancy were the two parameters that predicted uptake. So if you had a long receptor dwell time, or if you went to a higher concentration to get a higher occupancy of the receptor, um, then you would get uh, clustering and uptake of the receptor leading to internalization. So this for me is where it became exciting because that means that I can now start looking uh, and start thinking about constructs such as fluorescently labeled glycosylated vaccines um, and correlated to the immune response um, that people have seen downstream. It's like do different binding inter interactions at the beginning 
the downstream to different T cell activation uh, parameters. And then we're going to ex expand the experiment to other lectins. And of course, start looking on actual primary immune cells rather than mannose receptor transfectins, but that's all for later. But I think for this, what I realized as I got super excited when this, these data started coming in is that uh, the love is definitely back for carbohydrates and I'll probably be working on them a lot uh, in the near future. So to conclude, I gave you two stories, one about the use of a paint-based microscopy technique uh, to image carbohydrate lectin interactions on live cells, but also one about the use of click chemistry in correlative microscopy to image enzyme activities, bacteria, and, and anything you like uh, uh, with this high content technique. So many people to thank, but I'll be very quick. Lorenzo Abatazzi and Roger, uh, the super resolution microscopy collaborators have been uh, phenomenal collaborators. Jeroen Coday and Tim, uh, in-house as well, Thomas Buckham for all the CLEM work with Tom Costa and Bart for the sy synthesis of uh, about half the clusters. As it, this is actually Christmas last year. Uh, sadly, that was our last group outing uh, before Corona. And uh, with that, I'd like to end and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>